Turn with me today to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 is where we're going today. John chapter 15. So many times I hear um, people say to me as they make appointments to come to my office, they'll come and sit down with me. And this is what I continue to hear over and over and over again. I keep hearing people say, Pastor, really what I want, all I want out of life is I just want to be happy. I want to be happy. How many of you want to be happy? Raise your hand. How many of you want to be happy? Amen. It's okay to want to be happy. Happiness is a good thing. Nothing wrong with being happy. How many of you are happy today? Touch your neighbor and say, notify your face. <laughs> smile at me. Come on, be proud of what you got. Come on, smile at me. A, a beautiful smile has nothing to do with the quantity or the number of teeth that you have in your mouth. It has to do with your attitude and your gratefulness to God. You may only have two teeth. Be proud of what you've got. Use what God has given you. Amen? And smile a while and give your face a rest. Raise your hands to the one you love the best. Come on, somebody. You remember that song we sang in kids' church? But I'm, I'm, we all desire, we, the thing that we feel like we want more than anything else is happiness. But this is what I found about happiness how many of you, now I don't want, I want you to tell the truth now. Don't, don't, don't tell a story. You're in church. How many of you know that you love the smell of a brand new car? Let me see your hand. Let me see how many know it. Come on, let's be real about it. You know who else knows you love the smell of a brand new car? A salesman. That's why he'll say, hey, hold on just a second. Let me get the key. Because he'll open that door up and suck you right on in that car by that new car smell. And let me tell you something, you are as happy, as you can, you're can. you driving off that lot and that thing smells brand new and boy, you are happy, happy, happy. But guess what happens? After a few trips to Burger King and Wendy's and Dairy Queen and Popeye's Chicken and you dropping some chicken crumbs between the seats, come on somebody, don't act like you ain't never done that. Look at me, y'all. You know, and somebody, uh, it, it, after a while, about six months down, that thing ain't smelling like it smelled to begin with. Let's be real about it. And you're not quite as happy as you were. You know why that is? Because happiness is based on things that are around you. Happiness is based on things that you can put your hand on, surrounding circumstances. Those things can change, and guess what happens? So does your happiness. But see, there's something that God has given all of us that the Lord gives us that is not based on something that goes on around out here, but something that goes on deep down in here. And it's called joy. I want to talk to you for the next few moments on the joy in Jesus. Somebody say joy in Jesus. Say it again. Say joy in Jesus. Not joy in Jack Daniels. Joy in Jesus. <laughs> joy in Jesus. I want to talk to you for that real quick. And if you'll help me preach today, we'll expedite this sermon. Amen. You, some of y'all will find some amens you didn't know you had. Amen. John chapter 15, verse 4, the Bible said, remain in me. Somebody say, remain in me. It's Jesus speaking. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you, watch him say it again, remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Somebody say much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you Remain in, boy, y'all are slow today. 
If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Over and over and over again, Jesus says these three words, remain in me. Remain in me. Me. Did you see that? How many times did he say that over and over and over again? He says what? Remain in me. Now, there's a message here. It's simple, and it's that we are to remain in him. But what's the big, what's the real reason for this? There's several answers we could give. Of course, the most important answer would be, that it's because we want to maintain our relationship with him. But what he says this in verses 4 through 7 and then tells us four verses later in verse 11 why he says this. Look in verse 11. I have, now notice these words now. You got to read this. I have told you this so. Everybody say so. I told you remain in me. Remain in me, remain in me, remain in me so that my joy may be where? Where? That it might be in you. And that your joy may be, this version, the New International Version says complete. One version you have in front of you may be say, it may say full. That your joy may be full. I, I, I'm telling you to remain in me because the only place you're going to find joy that is down deep inside you is when you stay close to Jesus and you remain in him. Somebody say this with me. Joy in Jesus. There's the only place that you can find joy is in Jesus. Joy, ladies and gentlemen, is something totally different than happiness. I know you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to take you somewhere today. Just follow the preacher. I'm going to do it as quick as possible today. Joy is in Jesus. He said, I have told you to remain in me so that you may, that my joy may be in you. There's something interesting about this word joy. The word joy there is from the Greek word kaira. Kaira, which is literally what kaira is. Kaira is a Greek noun that means this. It literally means that it is an inner gladness or delight or rejoicing. It is, watch this now, it is a deep, Seated pleasure. It is a depth. Now, now I want you to get this. It's a depth of assurance and confidence based on spiritual realities. And it is, catch this, y'all. This is good stuff. It is independent of what is going on around you. Notice that word independent. Joy is independent. Joy is something of its own. Joy is something that lives by itself. It doesn't have, it, it has nothing to do with how much money you have in your pocket. It has nothing to do with what kind of relationship you're in right now. It has nothing to do with your circle of friends. It has nothing to do with what kind of car you drive. It has nothing to do with what kind of clothes you wear. I feel like preaching now. It has nothing to do with anything going on around you. If, you, if, if what is going on around you is dictating to you how you feel, then all you're experiencing is a Vanishing happiness and not an inward joy. Oh, y'all better hear me today. See, van happiness vanishes. Happiness vanishes at the bottom of the cup. Happiness vanishes when I'm done with the Oreo blizzard. Come on, somebody. Anybody like blizzards, raise your hand. 
Anybody don't like blizzards, just keep your hand in your lap. <laughs> this is a new season. It's November or going up into October, headed to November. We're getting into the season where they're going to introduce another. They introduce every year the pumpkin pie blizzard. Somebody say glory. Glory. At the bottom of the cup when you're done is these little pieces of pie crust that they have at the bottom. And you can eat those and you think, glory, glory. glory." Until the last one is gone, you can buy a small and your happiness will only last the length of a small one. You can buy a medium and happiness only lasts the length of a medium. You can buy a large and I would suggest that you doesn't buy anything any larger. (laughs) You're, you're, you're on the verge of a coma. But here's the thing. It's, it, it's conditional. But if you hear what I said today, hear when you understand Kyra. Everybody say Kyra. When you understand Kara, when you understand that joy is inward, when you understand joy is deep-rooted, when you understand the depth of assurance and confidence that's based on the spiritual reality, it's based on your relationship with the Lord Jesus, it's based on the power of the Holy Spirit that is where? On the inside of you. It's on the inside and the world can't get to it. It's on the inside and that person trying to terrorize you you can't get to that joy that's on the inside of you it's on the inside of you the world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away from you somebody take about 60 seconds and give God praise for joy it's inward it's inside and the enemy can't get to see so here's what I need you to understand happiness is based on what's going on around you But joy is based on what's going on in you. Happiness is dictated by circumstance. Joy comes from Jesus. So here it is. In other words, you can have joy no matter what the circumstance. You can can have joy when you're broke. Hello? I didn't say you were going to be happy. (laughs) Don't act like you're happy when you're broke. Ain't nobody happy when they're broke. But you can't have joy. See, joy is something that God puts inside you to get through the seasons of your life when you are broke. Anybody ever been broke? Raise your hand. Somebody said, Pastor, what you talking about? I'm broke right now. (laughs) I've been there. I know. Glory to God. But joy is something God gives us to get through. The seasons of being broke, the seasons of going through divorce, the seasons of going through foreclosure, the seasons of going through sickness, the seasons of not understanding what's going on with your children, the seasons of not understanding what's going on on your job, the seasons that you walk through where you realize, where you feel like you ain't got no friends and you ain't got nobody to help you and nobody to, and and everything and the enemies come in like a flood. It's joy on the inside of you that's going to get you through that. You can have joy no matter what the circumstance. Probably one of the greatest verses in Scripture to to help you understand and to describe the joy that I'm talking about is a a familiar verse, one that you're familiar with, but I want to break down today, and I want to share something interesting that I've learned about this verse. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. He writes in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 from the Amplified Version. He said, not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content. Somebody say content. And self-sufficient through Christ. And self-sufficient through Christ. Satisfied. Somebody say satisfied. I'm going to go ahead and tell you one of the biggest problems we have. We can't be satisfied. Satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy. 
Now notice these last four words. Regardless of my circumstance. What? I'm not disturbed or uneasy. Regardless of my circumstance. Now I don't know about you. But I don't like to hear from nobody that don't know what they're talking about. You know what I found out? I found out a lot of times experience is better than education. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Let me give you a little example. I had a friend of mine that was a, we were a young evangelist trying to make a living preaching the gospel. He went to school so he could have him a little side gig to be, he went to a tech school to learn uh, heating and air conditioning, that, that field, whatever that is. And there was a job opening, and a contractor hired a guy over him that had a boatload of experience but never went to the tech school. He was an apprentice. He learned firsthand. He hired him over my friend who had the education. My friend said, you know what the truth of the matter was? He knew a whole lot more than I did. He said, I could barely turn one on. Because he had learned by experience. You see, I don't want somebody telling me, man, I, I, I've learned how to handle. I, you know, I, I'm content. I'm, you know, I don't want somebody telling me that that ain't never been through anything. Don't you get tired of people when, you, when you're struggling in life and you're going through hardships and you ain't got no money. And, and I mean, you really down and somebody, somebody that they got plenty of money and everything's going their way. And they just pat you on the back and say, baby, it's going to be better after a while. I don't want you to pat me on the back. And they, they try to tell you how to get through. To, I want somebody to tell me how to get through a situation that has walked where I'm walking. Somebody who has been the mile. Somebody who has been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Then you can come and try to kind of give me some comfort if you've been there. Touch your neighbor and say, if you've been there. Folks wanting to tell you something and they never been there. Hello? Never been there. So here was my thing. Okay, Paul. Okay, preacher. Okay, apostle. See, y'all want to run around throwing these, these uh, <laughs> titles around? Paul got his straight. Paul, the Bible said, was the chief of the apostles. Okay, apostle, it's easy for you to talk about how you contend. You ain't never been through. No, see, this is, when I hear the apostle Paul tell me this, I, I want to know that he has the, the credentials to tell me this. I want to know he's been through something. So it's it, in and of itself that verse can be somewhat comforting, but it's more comforting when you understand where Paul is. See, Paul writes the entire book of Philippians in the Mamertine prison. Well, some of y'all know that. I ain't told some of y'all anything new. Oh, yeah, I've heard he was in the Mamertine prison. Well, here's the thing about it is, do you know what the Mamertine prison was? The Mamertine prison was a prison in Rome. And it was a prison in the days of the Romans, when the Romans were very evil and very cruel people. As a matter of fact, when we talk about, now, now give me a, your attention for just a moment, we'll get up out of here. When we talk about Mamer, the Mamertine prison, the Mamertine prison was, was a place that they would hold prisoners as they were on death row. As a matter of fact, the, the Mamertine prison was the same prison that the apostle Peter had been in right before they crucified him upside down on a cross. But here's what's interesting about the Mamertine prison. The Mamertine prison, when you study the history of this thing, and you understand what it's like. As a matter of fact, you can go to where the, the, this prison was and see what it looks like even to this day. But it was comprised of only two and some say three dark underground dungeons. 
But the interesting thing about them is, and, and let, let, me, let me just pull, pull that picture up right quick. This is a picture of what the Mamertine prison would have looked like. If you can look at this and you can tell it's not real high. As a matter of fact, it would be only head high maybe to a, a person six feet tall. No taller than six feet. So in other words, the roof of it was here. And then it's a stone wall all around you like this. Now here's the interesting thing about it. The Mamertine prison was, it was three levels underground. You had one level. And to get in it, they would see, if you look right here, let me show you here. And, and maybe you could look over there. I, I wish I could point it both at the same time, but I can't. But at the bottom of the picture, you see this hole. See that hole over there at the bottom? This is the hole that they would be let down. Now, this is one level. This would, let's just say this is the first level. There's a hole at the top of this thing just like this that they had to let them into this level. Underneath this, further underground, is another level. So they drop them down in a hole just big enough for them to fit through to the next level. And then they do the same thing to the third level. You're that far underground. You got this much room over your head. You're like this so you can imagine how claustrophobic it might have been. But this is what history says. That Paul was not in the first or the second level. If it was three, he was in the third. They dropped him to the lowest level. Think what kind of, how that would work on your mind. Before you start to think of any type of comfort at all in this situation, remember that Paul, before he was thrown into this jail, had been beaten. So he's whipped and he has open lacerations. If you look at this Mamertine prison, you will notice this little cell right here is absent of something. There's no bathroom. He's dropped down into this place, no place to go to the bathroom. Open lacerations. After a while, he has to relieve himself. So he's in this place with everything that he's relieved himself of for the last however long he's been there. Infection has started up. Rats are running everywhere. He's in this prison. Listen to what they say about the Mamertine prison. Remember, the Romans were evil people. The Mamertine prison is compromised or comprised, excuse me, of only two dark or three dark underground dungeon places, one on top of the other, and it was said that Paul was held in the lower one. Now watch this. The conditions in these dungeons were said to have been closer to a sewage tank than a prison cell. It was also said that people were lowered into them, thrown into them, lowered down, and they were forgotten about and sometimes many of them died before they ever went to execution because they had starved to death in this manhole. Paul the apostle, follower of Jesus, is beaten with open lacerations. Infection has started in. He's sitting in his own dung and urine. Rats are running everywhere. He's claustrophobic, if you will. He don't know if he'll ever get out of there. But yet, he writes this. Not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content. Oh, I get it. This is the perfect, comfortable setting to write. Oh, everybody feels like writing when your back's been whipped and you're sitting in your own stuff and you, you're claustrophobic and you're... 
oh, I'm sorry. We can't really relate to that because most of us like to ride at Starbucks over a $7 cup of coffee. Well, let's be real about it. But Paul, see, Paul has the credentials. Paul has the right to say, I have learned to be content and self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or I'm not uneasy regardless of my circumstance. In other words, Paul said, hey, baby, they can take, they can beat my back. They can whip my back and open up my back and they can drop me down in the lower level and leave me there to die and not even include a bathroom. And I may have to sit here in my own stuff and I may have rats running across my feet and I may not be in the best circumstances. I may not be staying at the Holiday Inn Express. Come on, somebody. I might not be at the Hyatt. I might May not be at the western but I can tell you they have taken my happiness but I brought something in with me I got something on the inside of me I got something deep down inside that no matter what they do to me no matter where they send me I got joy on the inside and you can't take it from me somebody spend the next 60 seconds and praise God not for what's around you but what you got in you what you have on the inside you can't take it divorce can't take it foreclosure can't take it repossession can't take it hello somebody your kids acting like demons can't take it come on somebody They can't take it. Something that God gives you to get through the storms of life. Something that will cause you to raise your hands when all hell has come against you. Something you got inside you that gives you a confidence that says, this too shall pass. This is only a season. I'm walking through this. And something that allows you to look at that bad season and try to find the promise of God in it. Because James 1 says, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. For the trying of my faith is working patience. But Patience is going to have its perfect work. I'm trying to find 50 people in this room right now that you can look in the situation you're in right now and you can see God in your trouble, God in this present situation. Somebody better praise the Lord like you know God is walking you through the season of your life. I don't know who you are, but God's talking to you today. I don't know what you're going through, but God is talking to you today. I don't care how dark it gets. I don't care how much trouble comes. He didn't give it. He can't take it. What do you do? What do you do with a man like this? What do you do with a man you beat? Tie up. Drop him in a sewage hole. Let the rats run over his feet. And he still keeps writing. Hello. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, now that's an author. That's an author. That's the author of the book that says Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's the one. Let me tell you something. It Oh, it gets so much better, y'all. It was the inner joy. Y'all better listen to what I'm, I'm y'all going to make me preach all day long. I'm going to quit right here in just a minute. I heard somebody say, no, you ain't. Listen. Listen. They beat his back. Drop him down to the lower level in a claustrophobic situation where he's sitting in his own junk. And it keeps on. Oh, but it gets better. 
They lift him up out of there. And the message wasn't, Paul, we're going, you're done. You've served your time, man. Go enjoy. He said, no, now we're going to take you down here and cut your head off. You, do you know that Paul knew that they were going to cut his head off? He had already heard Nero, the Roman emperor, a very horrible man. Already give the already give the word. He knew what was going to happen. He knew his head was going to be cut off. He knew his head was going to be cut off when he wrote a letter to Timothy. He said, Timothy, guess what, buddy? I, I fought a good fight. And I have kept the faith. What do you mean? He meant, hey, I kept it when things were good and I kept it when things are bad. What, how, how did he keep the faith? How do you keep the faith? You got to have the joy of the Lord on the inside of you. Joy that's going to get you through death. Joy that's going to get you through sickness. Joy that's going to get you through every trial of life that will help you hold on to your faith in God. That will help you to praise God even when you're walking through the darkest moments of your I have found somebody in this room that knows what I'm talking about. Joy. Joy, I got it deep down inside of me. When I need to tap into it, I can tap into it. Joy. Joy. Forty-nine years of it now, y'all. Forty-nine years of joy. As soon as I accepted Jesus, I got joy. Joy that's taken me all over through this situation and that situation. Joy when people love me and joy when people were getting ready to run me off. I ain't always pastored a church like this, y'all. But joy got me through it. Every season of life he'll give you joy Paul said Timothy hold on to it son it's worth it in the end I fought a good fight I kept the faith henceforth there's a crown of righteousness laid up before me see they couldn't do nothing with Paul because death didn't mean nothing to Paul he had already said if I live I'm going to preach Christ but if I die I'm going home to be with him what can you do with that? It's joy. God sent the preacher by today to encourage somebody in your joy. Who are you today? Who is the person sitting here today walking through the greatest trial of your life? You've been through it. I mean you have been through hell. But God told me to remind you, you got joy. Joy for what? Joy for the hell moments in your life. He gives you joy. Joy for claustrophobia. Joy for infection set up. Joy when rats are running across your feet. Come on, somebody. He gives you something on the inside. You can close your eyes and just have your own moment like Paul and Silas in a midnight jail and start singing all my life. He has been faithful. Who are you today? Who is it walking through the toughest season of your life? I'm going to ask you, all of you, to stand with me now. And I see some of you already lifting your hands. I see you. I see you. This is your moment. Right now, this is your moment. Who are you? 
Who are you that says, hey, pastor, I'm just going to tell you, it's, I'm, I'm walking through it. I'm going through it. Let me see your hand. Lift your hand. I'm walking through it. I believe that God is about to give somebody so much joy on the inside. Whew. Somebody that walked in into this room. Hallelujah. Not knowing how you were going to deal with the next moment of your life. You're going to tap into your joy. You're going to tap into your joy that's going to ch change how you feel about the situation today. It's going to cause you to lift up your hands and give the devil a fit all the way home. When the devil thought that he had you to the place that you were just about ready to give up. About ready to walk away from something. And then somebody started talking to you about joy. Is that you? Who was it again? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let me see you. You're at that place. Would you just lift both of those hands where you stand right now? Someone standing by them, reach up and put your hand on them. Someone full of the Holy Ghost right here. Just touch them. Touch them. Just reach up and touch them. Hallelujah. Make a connection with them. We're praying for joy today. Joy on the inside of you. Joy that the world did not give you. Joy that the world cannot take away from you. Praise God. Listen, listen, listen to me. Right now, in Jesus' name, this is what I want to do. George is going to sing something. This is what I want you to do. Every one of you that are around them that put your hand on them, I want you to pray for joy. That's what I'm asking you to do. Lord, just, Lord, I pray for joy. I pray for their joy, that their joy would be full today. Come on, that their joy would be full. Would you do that right now? Just begin to pray for that person. Right now, open up your mouth and begin to pray for the person. You put your hand on them right now. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. You see them. You see them, Lord. You see them all across this room, their hands raised. Lord, I pray for their joy. Lord, help them to tap into the joy that only you give. I see you. I see you just begin to praise him. If that's you, just begin to praise him. Praise him because God is giving you the joy to get through where you are now. Joy. Joy. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Accept it right now. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus.